Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Cameron Norris and I'm a project associate on the National Campaign for Healthy Food Access at the Food Trust and I have the great fortune of moderating today's webinar, Grocery Store and Retailer Scorecard. I'm so excited that you all have joined us today in this engaging conversation. And before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, this webinar will be recorded and made available online. We'll be sure to send the link to the archive to all the participants today, and we'll also post it online on the Healthy Food Access Portal so everyone can visit it. Each speaker today will talk for roughly 10 minutes, which will hopefully leave us ample time at the end of today's presentations to answer questions you may have. And we'll try our best to get to as many questions as we can today. You can use the chat feature on the lower right corner of your screen on your GoToWebinar panel to submit questions at any time during today's webinar. Please feel free to direct those questions to either a specific speaker or to the entire panel. And finally, if you have any technical questions or issues with volume or anything, you please feel free also to use the chat function and a member of our technical team will assist you. And we are hosting this webinar today as a feature of the Healthy Food Access Portal, an endeavor supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and builds upon the partnership of PolicyLink, the Food Trust, and Reinvestment Fund. Together, we work to promote and increase equitable access to healthy food. And to briefly introduce these three co-sponsors of the portal, PolicyLink is a national research and action institute advancing economic and social equity by lifting up what works. The Food Trust is a national nonprofit based in Philadelphia with the mission to ensure that everyone has access to fresh, affordable food and the information they need to make healthy decisions. And Reinvestment Fund is a national community developed financial institution, or CDFI, and national leader in rebuilding America's distressed towns and cities through the use of innovative capital and information to finance projects, including food access. And we invite you all to visit the portal to get more information on other healthy food access topics. And first off today, we'll hear from Julie Garrell and Amy Schlechta co-directors of Project on Nutrition and Wellness at the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution. Before joining Convergence, Julie led branding and communications programs for a wide range of clients, including travel, food, retail, and telecommunications marketers. Julie worked at J. Walter Thompson Worldwide and other advertising agencies as a Senior Vice President Account Director. She has led countless hours of consumer interviews in the form of focus groups, in-depth one-on-one dialogue, and ethnographic studies. Her creative approach to obtaining qualitative customer, excuse me, consumer data has resulted in successful rebranding initiatives with measurable bottom line impacts. Julie has a Master of International Business from Thunderbird, Thunderbird School of Global Management and a Master's in Sustainability and Environmental Management from Harvard. Her thesis focus was on the ability of inclusionary processes to create behavior change. She received her undergraduate degree from New York University in journalism and mass communications. And Amy is a magna cum laude graduate of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. While there, she developed a passion for improving the health and wellness of adults and children through public policy efforts directed at food, nutrition, and physical activity. Her thesis examined various political and environmental determinants and their collective impact on childhood obesity among low-income and minority children living in urban environments. As an intern and consultant with the New York City Department of Health, Amy worked to improve the food and physical activity landscape of New York City public schools through policy and program initiatives and subsequent evaluations to assess the impact of these efforts. Prior to completing her master's degree in public health, she served as a clinical research coordinator for a qualitative study of adolescent vaccinations at the University of Rochester Medical Center. She also holds a bachelor's degree in health sciences and a minor in environmental science from Georgetown University. 
and Adam Broomberg, the director of Food and Brand Lab at Cornell, Cornell University, is also a research specialist in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell. Working directly with Brian Wensink and Cornell Center for Behavioral Economics and Child Nutrition co-director David Just, Adam coordinates academic and industry research. Adam joined the Food and Brand Lab after a lengthy marketing and sales career in the wine industry, during which he worked with all the links of the distribution chain, as well as acting as a marketing and research consultant to a variety of industry and nonprofit clients. And finally, Dr. Allison Carpen is the Associate Director of the Center for Research in Education and Social Policy at the University of Delaware. She's also an Associate Professor of Education and of Behavioral Health and Nutrition at the University of Delaware. She holds adjunct faculty positions at the University of Pennsylvania and Thomas Jefferson University and is an Associate Fellow for the Center for Public Health Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining University of Delaware, Dr. Carpin served as a Director of Research and Evaluation Trust in Philadelphia for 11 years where her research focused on understanding healthy food purchasing and consumption behavior, especially among children. Dr. Carpin is committed to informing policy and practice with rigorous research designs. Her current research efforts include the study of corner store programs in urban areas and in-store marketing approaches in supermarkets to promote purchase and consumption of healthier options. She is also conducting research to understand the impact a new supermarket has on residents and the surrounding community. She has published widely on topic, excuse me, topics related to school food, supermarket access, healthy corner stores, and strategies to develop and maintain farmers markets in low income areas. And on this next page here, um, there's a few resources displayed that you can find on the Healthy Food Access Portal. There's the Healthy Food Marketing page within the Retail Strategy section of the portal, as well as previous webinars and related topics of healthy food marketing and shopping. Feel free to check those out. You'll be able to access all of those and much more through the link at the bottom of this page, healthyfoodaccess.org. And now we'll start off the presentation for today by hearing from Julie and Amy. So please take it away whenever you two are ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cameron. We're delighted to be here with all of you. Um, so let me go ahead and get started. Great. Okay, so uh, for those of you that are not familiar, familiar, the Project on Nutrition and Wellness, or PNW for short, is a project of the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution. And the Convergence Center for Policy Resolution is an organization where we bring diverse stakeholders together to help address um, issues of national importance where we feel that by bringing diverse voices and perspectives and expertise in the room, we're better able to address an issue um, by having people work together in a collaborative way rather than working in their own silos or fighting against one another. And so we bring people together for a period of time to help build trust and foster relationships and from there to identify actionable ways for our diverse stakeholder group to work together to address an issue. So the project on nutrition and wellness began in 2012. Uh, we started convening uh, groups from across the entire nutrition and wellness spectrum to help them find ways to work together rather than working in their individual silos. And so we've had representatives from consumer packaged goods companies, grocery stores, health insurance companies, uh, public health and academia, as well as all of the different groups that touch on nutrition and wellness uh, among consumers in order to really identify meaningful ways for these groups to work together. Um, and through the course of our early uh, stakeholder interactions, our stakeholders came together around the common mission of making the healthful choice the easy, affordable, enjoyable choice through cross-sector collaboration and really looking at consumer demand rather than telling the consumer what they should be doing, but um, looking at ways to harness market forces and to create win-win solutions for all of our stakeholders at the table. So looking at ways to build business value for the private sector while also 
promoting healthier choices among consumers and improving public health outcomes. And so just um, a couple of the things that really make PNW unique are our multi-sectoral composition. All of our meetings and stakeholder groups, our individual working groups where we identify opportunity areas are multi-sectoral. So we really want to make sure that we have every voice and every perspective represented. Uh, we bring the stakeholders together in a safe space for constructive dialogue, and we provide in-depth learning experiences to really make sure that the opportunity areas that we're looking at are well informed. Uh, we also have um, re more recently really looked at the food retail sector as a real opportunity area to promote uh, healthier, healthier eating among consumers and promote the growth of sales of healthier foods, and um, looked at ways to test new strategies and to eventually scale those up at a national level. And so the grocery retail scorecard came out of our phase one of our uh, dialogue series. And um, the Cornell Food and Brand Lab team, as well as the Food Trust, were involved in those discussions. And really, it was identified as a way to tap into the food retail sector, and allow food retailers to work together with public health to promote healthier eating among consumers. And so throughout this process, we've uh, engaged with the Cornell Food and Brand Lab team, as well as a number of different grocery retail partners as well as a number of different public health partners and other organizations to make this as well-informed and um, as successful of a product as we could create. And so what the Grocery Retail Scorecard is, uh, Adam will provide much more detail, but uh, it is uh, based on some work that they did with the school lunchroom. And so looking at a set of evidence-based strategies that grocery stores could implement in their stores at low or no cost, which would then drive sales of better for you foods and help consumers make the easier, healthy choice. And so the scorecard, as Adam will show you, uh, really accounts for all aspects of the grocery store. So it takes into account all the different things that consumers will come into contact with when they're making those food purchase choices. So that is it on our end. Thank you so much. Am I on? Yes, Adam. Now we'll turn it okay, over great. to you to take over for the scorecard. All right. Very good. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and uh, hopefully we can give you some brief information about the retail scorecard and what it looks like. Uh, and just quickly, I'm going to run through a little bit of some of the baseline research that we've used to inform uh, all of our work around the environment and how it impacts food choices. Um, for example, um, so but essentially what we are is uh, we're a consumer behavior research lab based at Cornell University, and we do research on how uh, factors in the environment impact choices and food experiences. So for those of you who are out there um, eating your lunch while you're watching this webinar, uh, I'm, I hope you have portioned food in front of you because if you have unportioned food uh, while you're doing something like watching a screen, uh, you will eat 28% more than if you're just uh, talking with a friend or with family members. Um, larger plate, larger meal. Every two inches increase in the size of your plate is about 25% uh, more of you will serve yourself. Americans eat 92% of what we serve ourselves, so you can do the math. Um, we're not super great at using information all the time, except for all the dietitians on the call. You guys are great. Um, but uh, we, we did a study where we gave a group of people, two, uh, we gave them all fat-free yogurt, we, or I'm uh, sorry, fat-free granola. We told half of them that it was fat-free, and everybody else uh, just thought it was regular granola. The fat-free folks ate 35% more volume because they were spending those calorie savings, as well as they thought that they would need more to fill themselves up from, since there wasn't uh, as much, since there wasn't any fat in, in the granola. And out of sight, out of mind is a real thing. It works with, with all kinds of stuff, and particularly with food. We did a study in our building back at Cornell where we gave all the admins uh, candy dishes, and we secretly refilled them at night. Every three feet further away from your seat, uh, the candy dish was with uh, several fewer candies you eat in a day. Over the course of a week, that adds up to an awful lot of extra calories, and you can see how that might add up at the end of the, of, um, of a couple of weeks. Basically, uh, food decisions are not, are very similar to the way we, we, we make all our regular decisions. We have two. Um, have I lost the mouse? No. Okay. We have two basic deci decisions. We have the emotional and the deliberative system. 
we can basically just think of these as kind of a hot and cold state. Which one we're able to use depends entirely on, on the cognitive resources we have available to us. And to put it in, 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 a, in a simpler term, uh, how stressed we are. The more stressed you are, the more likely you are to make an, an indulgent choice or uh, to, uh, or, or to, or to reward yourself for being stressed out, uh, or most importantly, when you're trying to introduce new sets of foods to people, when you're stressed out, you're less likely to make uh, the choice of a new item because uh, the last thing we want to do when we're stressed out is be uh, disappointed by that thing we're using for comfort, which for so many of us is food. Uh, context in which food is presented to you makes a, a great deal of matter, um, has a big impact as well. We ran this study on campus uh, about a year ago where we had 56 people and we took them on a two-mile pre-lunch tour. Half of them were told they were uh, just being taken on a scenic tour of campus. The other half were told they were getting a little more exercise, getting some exercise before lunch. The exercise group rewarded themselves. They spent those the extra calories they burned uh, by eating about 35% more pudding. We've actually rerun that study on several occasions. The results are, are pretty, are, are pretty uh, standard. Uh, if you think you're exercising, you're more likely to um, reward yourself a little bit later. So uh, that's particularly true for people who are not serious hardcore athletes, uh, kind of the, the rest of us, the people who are just kind of casual exercisers. Um, uh, how we present uh, foods to us makes a huge difference. We did a, a famous study where we invited a large group of folks in to um, uh, test a pre a pre fixed meal. We told them we would ask them just some questions about the menu and, and the service. Uh, all, everybody, all the groups had exactly the same dining experience, with one exception. One group was given as a thank you a bottle of wine that was labeled as being from California. The other group was given a bottle of wine that was labeled as being from North Dakota. Um, so uh, I'm hoping there are no North Dakota wine collectors out there, but if there are, I apologize. Um, not surprisingly, when we did. Uh, mouse is wondering. That's surprising when we asked the folks about the quality of the wine. Uh, they gave, they rated the, the, the California wine significantly higher. I don't seem to have the mouse. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, but when we asked the, the people about the flavor of the food, the people who had the California bottle of wine actually rated the food taste about a percent, uh, about a point and a half higher, which is really, really amazing. But just something as simple as the, the, this bottle of wine that was served just as, almost as a, as a throwaway and totally impacted their entire experience of, of dining. Uh, they also said the service was better. The California people also said the service was better. They stayed longer. And when we asked them if they'd be willing to participate in another experiment later, the California folks uh, said about 90 percent yes. And the uh, North Dakota folks, uh, only 15 percent of them said they'd come and do another experiment with us. Uh, just to how you name and label foods has a huge impact on people's experience of them. Uh, we did a, a choice set study where we gave people choices between one group was asked to choose between red beans and rice, and another group was asked to uh, got, got an opportunity to choose traditional Cajun red beans with rice. And uh, we did this with several different foods, including, including uh, seafood, uh, seafood fillet, chicken parmesan, and chocolate pudding. Uh, if it had the fancy name, uh, the, so those four were those foods were 27 percent more likely to be selected, and much more importantly there was a 10% increase in willingness to pay. In other words, people were willing to pay 10% more for the named foods uh, because uh, than they were for the unnamed foods. And this is because the, 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 the naming of them actually changes our expectation of what the flavor is. Succulent fish is just is a lot better than fish. Uh, and uh, you know something like the Tuscan chicken that's aspirational. Who doesn't want to go to Tuscany? So that actually impacts your experience and how much you uh, are willing, how much you, you like it. Simple things in the environment have a huge impact as well. Uh, the order in which you see food has a, a huge impact in what you're likely to select. In a standard buffet, uh, the most people's plates will be comprised, 68% of their plate will be comprised of the first three items in line, almost uh, regardless of what those items are. And we've done this uh, study many times where we've set up two sides of, of a buffet where the, the, uh, the food order is exactly reversed in one. So on one side, it's chicken and mashed potatoes. And the other side, it's just uh, salad and fruit and steamed veggies. When you get to the end of the line, the people on the, 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 the veggie side have three quarters, almost three quarters of their plate is the more helpful items. So just so that little organizational thing can have a huge impact on um, uh, how, uh, what we actually select. It works in schools as well. 
um, reordering a milk cooler so that the white milk is in front of the chocolate milk and it's about a third of the total of milk available. We'll increase the selection of white milk by up to 50%, um, uh, whereas we've seen in some schools where they've removed uh, flavored milk, overall fluid milk sales have declined by 10%, taking an important source of nutrient out of the daily diet of the kids. So moving more closely into the area that we're kind of talking about, the, the supermarket area, we ran a study recently where we did, we would like to do things that are super high tech whenever we have the opportunity. If you look at that diagram on the right hand side, uh, that, uh, uh, that's a piece of duct tape around the outside of a shopping cart. And essentially what we did here is we just put that piece of duct tape around and we gave people who had the divided cart instructions, hey, put the, put the front half of your cart, just put fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins there. Basically just suggesting to them that the half of the cart should be filled with, with, with helpful items. Uh, and once we, and we ran the numbers after, after the, in comparing, them, comparing them with people who didn't have the cut uh, a cart, uh, they, ate, they had about a 60% increase in purchase of fruits and vegetables, and the total share of cart went to almost three quarter, almost 70% with fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins. With nothing, you know, with no, no, uh, nothing more complicated than just saying, hey, uh, you know, why don't you try out half your cart out of these fruits and vegetables. Okay. All right, so how do we get started in, in working specifically in uh, supermarkets to kind of get people to buy healthier food? A group of uh, researchers uh, uh, in collaboration with the Danish government came to visit us back in 2009, and they had a simple idea, how do we make people buy healthier foods? And uh, you, I, with apologies, I'm going to show you a slide that, um, that you saw a minute ago because Julie likes to steal my slides. But well, we know from, um, or actually Amy in this case likes to steal my slides. And we know from human nature that all you have to do is you get to make sure somebody does something is tell them they can't do it. Uh, so human nature in a nutshell, don't climb in this pipe. That's all that anybody wants to do as soon as that happens. So the, 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 um, the, the plan that, uh, that was in place in Denmark at the time, you may have read about this, they were going to put a fat tax on, uh, on foods, maybe up to 30% based on the fat content of the school. Uh, and what we did was uh, they gave us actually an island off the coast of Denmark to experiment with. And we had a number of supermarkets in that island, eight, uh, eight supermarkets, and we just did some simple uh, nudging uh, ideas, which became the, the kind of the core of the scorecard later. By the way, they, did re they ended up repealing that fat tax uh, on the mainland of Denmark in, in no small part because they created a, a gigantic black market in salty and uh, high fat foods from, from Germany where people would line up on Sundays and then bring many, many dozens of, of cars in. Anyway, so uh, we, had to, we ran a number of these studies in, on the island for about two years. They tried some very simple things, uh, some labeling systems, uh, increasing access to, to healthier foods like grab-and-go snacks up by the, the, front, um, the front register, floor muscle, Formats that help to direct people or, or to point out the healthier foods uh, uh, in the store, um, and directional arrows that just basically lead people to, you know, we tend to follow directions. Uh, so when you see an arrow on the floor, you know, your natural incl inclination to, uh, to just follow that arrow. When we've used these, we've used these also in, in the supermarkets in America, they often uh, re re result in, a, in a, another 90 seconds of time people spend in the um, in the produce section, and of course, they, you know, you can't half your uh, cart can't be fruits and vegetables if you never go in the produce section. So just simple, some wayfinding stuff to direct people where you want them to go makes a big, a big difference. And of course, the, our, our friends in Denmark also checked out the divided carts. So the main takeaways for us uh, from the Denmark experience was that sales volume on the targeted items increased. They, they sold more fish, they sold more fruits and vegetables, uh, and they were very simple. And, and easy to, to, uh, to make, make changes that the supermarkets were happy to work with. Uh, because they were selling the items in the store that were uh, more likely to be perishable, they actually made more money because they were throwing, uh, throwing fewer uh, perishable goods away. And, uh, and we got to thinking, we only gave them eight things to choose from. What about all the other potential options there were uh, to work on? By this time, we had already, some of you may have already seen this, we had already released a 100-point Smarter Lunchroom uh, self-assessment scorecard which is being used by thousands of schools around the country right now as part of the Healthy U.S. School Challenge criteria from the USDA. And basically, that's just a set of 100, uh, that's, that's 100 things that schools can choose from to help their kids in the, in the cafeterias make better selections, uh, eat, uh, 
select more fruits and veggies. And since the kids get the chance to choose them for themselves, at the end they end up they end up eating a little bit more of the things they choose. It actually increases consumption um, as well as the increasing selection of the fruits and vegetables. Um, so we thought, you know, if we could take some of those ideas and then then blend them in with a retail scorecard, building on what we've learned in Denmark and some other pilot areas in the U.S., it would really could be something really, really powerful. And one of the things that we've learned from working with a school is if the scorecard is evidence-based, if there's a third party that endorses it, in the case of uh, the scorecard, it's the USDA. In the case of the retail scorecard, it's folks like yourselves and like THA uh, and uh, you know other uh, people who help to validate it. If there's a little, there's a little bit of competition. If it's easy, uh, you know, if you get one supermarket chain to work on it, or within a group of supermarket chains, one region is working against another region. Everybody wants to do, everybody wants to succeed, you know. So there's just a couple of little, little things you can build in, into the criteria to make it more motivating and more appealing for folks to try it out. So here are some basic things. Let's see. Get to the next one here. Here are some basic things that the, the, the uh, scorecard is uh, is uh, uh, built around. As Amy mentioned, it is organized by, by store area. For example, uh, we talk about the entrance to the store. Is there? Do we have divided carts? Are there healthier items the, among the first things that people see as they come in? We know that uh, priming uh, so with uh, seeing healthier items will lead to more more likely to purchase those items later on. Uh, in terms of the prepared food areas, it's a store. Uh, is there fruit and vegetable available in, in, in the prepared food? You know, do they use attractive bowls and uh, and uh, marketing techniques to promote promote the fruits and vegetables? Uh, at the checkout, does is there an aisle that's uh, no candy aisle? Uh, parents love this aisle anyway because it you know, cuts down on fights with the kids. But if you you can also say, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to um, uh, having a no candy aisle, if you bring some of those grab and go healthy snacks up to the front. That can be a double win. You can avoid the fight about the candy and also get the kids to try out a little bit more of the healthy snack aisles. Um, let's see. So those are some of the, 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 the key items. Let's try to go on. And we've been working on this thing for about a year and a half at this point now. Uh, and um, after we've created the first set of, uh, of criteria, we took it out into the field and we did a, a series of, uh, of uh, Comparison testings where you had a group of people go and do the, the assessment of the same store. Uh, thankfully for us, the iterator reliability is very, very high, about 90% amongst people with over with half the questions having 100% uh, agree, agreement. And as it turned out, the, the questions that were, there was the most disagreement are uh, um, the most likelihood of disagreement between two raters also had the lowest usability feedback, which Allison will talk about in a minute, and they've been remo removed from the more recent versions. Um, and using that, that research and also research that Allison will talk about in just a minute, uh, we, you know, we, we culled some of the questions that were more, uh, more difficult, and we adjusted the scoring. Um, and this is what the current, the current scoring bracket is. So nobody has to get 100 points, uh, which is good, because there's no longer 100 questions, and Allison will talk about that now. But more importantly, the baseline is, is pretty low, right? So most we want this tool to be an aspirational tool. And if you start out where nobody can get to the first run, nobody bothers to do it. It's just, you know, it's, uh, there's, no, there's no point in getting started if you can never really uh, achieve anything. So we wanted, to, we wanted most stores to be either at the bronze level or just very close to bronze level just before they started. So they'd have, they could say, hey, I don't have to do three things, and then I can achieve this, uh, this, this goal here. And so that's uh, that's essentially you know where we are. We've gotten the final final version. We've done some more recent more recent testing in a couple of other areas, showing that some of these things have had an increase of up to forty percent in the fruit and veg. Although we haven't uh, had a chance to publish that yet, but that's there's some recent uh, additional pilots we've done. And I guess the one we will hold questions now, and I will turn things over to Alice, who will tell you who will tell you more about her usability research, which was super helpful for us. Thanks, Adam. Um, can everyone hear me? I think so. Um, so uh, as part of the process, as, as Adam alluded, we um, went in and talked to a number of different um, retailers, both at the local level and then the C-suite or the corporate level, 
uh, to find out a little bit more about their perceptions of the tool, their interest in using a tool, what kind of incentives they would be most interested in, and uh, things of the sort. So what I was going to walk you through now is um, a little bit of an overview of uh, that study and some of the design elements. Um, the Center for Research in Education and Social Policy works to improve communities through research in both education and social policy. Um, and we were founded about a year and a half ago at the University of Delaware. The purpose of this study is to understand really um, the retailer's motivation and perceptions of the scorecard. And as Adam mentioned, um, we undertook this study sort of in the middle of uh, the development phase. So it's where we thought we had a pretty good uh, pilot tool. We had an instrument we liked, but at the same time we had a number of questions about what was most feasible, what would be most impactful, and how retail friendly the scorecard was generally. We had made some assumptions along the way, as you do with these things, of course, with advisors, but um, really needed to get some more deep dive feedback from retailers who had been a little less involved with us all along the way. I'm trying to change the slide, but there's a weird toolbar. Hold on. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, what we did then is we conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, C-suite executives and also store managers. We really wanted to make sure we had a good perspective both from folks um, at, the, at the corporate level and the local level to understand what it would be like to implement this scorecard. Our goal was to understand the potential for some of the items to generate revenue neutral or better sales, or at least their perception, uh, the receptivity to certain motivators. So <clears throat> why would you use this tool? Would it be related to customer loyalty, to some kind of national award? As we're developing the tools, these were the kinds of questions that came up. We were also interested in any concerns about implementing it or any worries about the feasibility, um, certainly to where uh, items could be shortened if they felt like there was duplication or replication in them. And then there was a bigger question about how this kind of tool would be implemented within a corporation or across corporations and whether or not uh, folks would be concerned that monitoring would be required if people would be worried that some were scoring it differently. So getting a little bit more into this idea of gaming the system and what concerns people had sort of off the top of their head about um, the scoring practices. Um, we had uh, a number of retailers who participated, um, interviews from retailers uh, across the U.S. And we also um, invited a number of other retailers to participate. Some declined. Um, some just engaged with us in a brief overview but didn't want to undertake such a long conversation about uh, the many items at the time that were on the tool. So. Um, we got a pretty good swath of retailers involved. Um, as I mentioned, the basic area uh, areas of inquiry for this work was to look at the concept of the scorecard just generally. Um, as Adam mentioned, you know, we kind of knew we were moving it out of the realm of uh, a cafeteria, which is a bit of a different context, um, and into a supermarket and wanted to understand people's perceptions more broadly about the concept whether or not the implementation feasibility would work, questions like, you know, how is this to do? Does it take too long to understand what these questions are really asking? Is it hard to answer them? Um, and who would answer them? And then also any implementation concerns or potential motivators for actually making the changes that were suggested on the tool. I am trying to change the slide. All right, so here's sort of the, the soup to nuts feedback. Um, and again, this is uh, data that was already integrated now into the next round, but I think it's important to sort of know the kind of um, feedback that we got. So feasibility, most folks thought that it seemed feasible off the top of their head. These were strategies that they had heard of before or maybe at one time had come up in the industry. Um, they felt like they were generally plausible to modify, so off the top of the head, their head, many of these uh, strategies did feel quite feasible. Um, sometimes the cost of implementing strategies caused concern. For example, if it was about um, moving infrastructure, uh, there's questions here about um, where the location of the bathroom is or the water fountain. Um, 
And, uh, and obviously, if the bathroom isn't there, that would be expensive to move. Um, so that was something that came up on occasion, but not for very many questions. Um, there was also some question about how this would impact bottom line and the shopping frequency, customer loyalty, and sales, which is what really the retailers, as you know, are most interested in. Um, and uh, I think some of the work that Adam's done now to, to clarify the relationship between using this tool and sales is useful, and we probably will need some more of it. But uh, you know, out of the out of the gate, that was something that came up. Manufacturers' decisions. Um, so at times there are questions about whether or not um, the the retailers are really the right person to be talking to about this. So if we're talking about the the makeup of end caps or signage or packaging, obviously that's a relationship um, that sometimes I mean that's a an issue that sometimes is in the purview of the retailer to decide, but other times might be in the purview of the manufacturer to decide. Um, and then there were some issues around store policies where there might be a policy about um, prohibiting, say, floor mats um, when indeed we were recommending that they be used. The other two um, major areas which I mentioned, um, the motivator, so why would a retailer decide to use this kind of tool? Um, the top answer we got was really that this was a corporate priority. Um, there was already an emphasis in the, in the company and concern for customer health and wellness. And this was really seen as um, a welcome addition to their toolbox to know how it is that they can actually make a difference and improve the health and wellness of their customer. Um, there are quite a few folks who brought that up. The next uh, most common answer was really about competition with retailers, customer loyalty, being able to offer an edge on the competition. Um, the extent of customer awareness also came up as a motivator. If customers were aware that one retailer was undertaking this kind of tool and another wasn't, that might motivate a retailer to um, jump on board and do this as well. Then there was also um, a potential um, motivator that was about making sure that customers had more choices, not fewer choices, and um, there was a, a, a particular question that I know has been modified at the time that this was particularly uh, in response to. When it came to scoring, um, there was a lot of questions about um, or concerns for, for uh, retailers who really wanted to try this and who are willing to to give it a go, getting um, thrown under the bus for doing it, and um, perhaps getting negative media, media for trying to do a good thing. And we really responded carefully to that. I think um, we learned that having a score of 100 made people want to feel like they should get 100, um, taking you back to you know the third grade math test where you should get them all right. And um, as Adam was clear all along, um, and, and the Food and Brand Lab folks, it, the whole goal wasn't necessarily for everybody to get an A-plus all the time, but rather to undertake the strategies in the tool that made the most sense for that particular retailer, um, and to move the needle on getting closer to doing more as opposed to um, you know, necessarily being um, getting your hand slapped for not doing enough. So I think we made some important changes in that regard to make sure that um, the scores uh, took on more of that meaning. Um, as I mentioned, and I'll just go through some of these items uh, more briefly, the feasibility um, was one that came up. Generally, people thought that uh, the strategies generally aligned with what they were already doing. We got feedback like, we already do that, that's easy. Um, there was, uh, at the same time, folks uh, did bring up some questions that they thought were a little bit harder. I'm not really sure how we're going to do this particular one, and those are questions that we responded to. We do know that managers are stewards of corporate agendas and priorities, and um, said another way, you know, a lot of times the managers felt like they they had the power to change just so much in their store, and beyond that, um, you know, some of the health and wellness messaging and decisions about buying and partnerships with other manufacturers just happened at a different level. And so they were um, uh, clear in reminding us that there were some items that were on those lists that they didn't feel would be appropriate to be held accountable for, um, that rather those were uh, issues that were handled at a different level. They were certainly willing, however, to do the scorecard if asked by a supervisor. They wouldn't necessarily want to add it on to their job otherwise, um, but they did like the idea of having incentives for scoring well. Um, the idea of having 
uh, score competition within retailer was very attractive, both at the C-suite and the manager level, that if the manager was doing a really great job implementing these strategies and keeping them consistent across store, that they might be able to receive an internal ranking that gave them kudos or other salary incentives that gave them kudos. Um, the idea of, uh, of being able to get um, positive feedback for hard work. Um, Category organization was generally well received, um, and by this I mean we had a lot of conversation about the right way to chunk the questions here. Um, so initially with 100 questions, you can imagine you know, which way was it best to organize it by, uh, by infrastructure kinds of questions or product placement kinds of questions, and really Adam made a good call, uh, or, or the Food and Brand Lab folks generally, I guess, made a good call to um, go by category. So that was a question we did a deep dive on, and it seemed like, generally speaking, people like this idea of starting with um, the entrance to the store, moving through the produce section, and, and so forth. Um, oops, this is a repeated one, sorry about that. So um, motivators. Generally, um, as I mentioned, they're looking for a tool that connect and drives customers to buy more, to shop more, and to be more loyal. And um, the question that came up then is, uh, you know, to what extent does this tool actually do that? We don't have good data at that about that with this particular tool right now, although we're, we're gaining more and more information about how it drives um, sales. Um, loyalty is another issue. but um, and. The question was really about helping to get customers into the store and ways to promote the concept that the store is doing a good job to improve um, the customer experience and their health and wellness. Um, there were other kinds of scorecards that retailers were familiar with, and I think it might be useful background um, just from a purely retail perspective. Folks brought up the idea of uh, Greenpeace's carting away the ocean effort, which laid out um, the things that a grocer should do to ensure that we don't overfish the oceans and that they're healthy. So there's an example of um, that, that this reminded folks of that which they have participated in. Um, implementing sustainable certified palm oil policies, again, a little more specific, but familiar with the idea of being able to sort of have this checklist of things that you should do in order to improve the, the, the healthfulness of your store. Um, and then other kind of benchmarking uh, things in this case, like AC Nielsen, which looks at where you stack up against food, drug, and other channels. Um, you could find where you are and bring it down to a comparison within a given region. So there was a lot of interest in being able to compare uh, from the retailer perspective where uh, our stores stand in comparison to similar stores or other stores in the region to know um, whether or not you're sort of beating out your competition in this regard or not. So this is a, a quick overview of um, a lot of the, the back and forth that we have with some of the retailers and the data that we compiled and then passed along to Adam and, and that uh, the Cornell folks responded to. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all so much for those great presentations. Um, we've been seeing really, really great questions coming in through the chat box throughout the whole webinar. Um, so we have just about 15 minutes left, so we'll definitely do our best to try to reach as many as we can with our time together. Um, I'm going to start with this one that could be for any one of the panelists. Um, this, and this person notes that it's new work, but they are for them, but they're interested in exploring this in their community. And the question is, how much freedom do individual grocery stores that are part of a larger chain have in making changes to their store? Can this work be done at a local level, or is it better to go straight to the corporate level? And again, that's for any panelists, um, so feel free, anyone, to jump in. I can, I can start that answer, but um, I think it really depends what kind of retail you're talking about. Uh, for example, we have a chain here in the Northeast called ShopRite where um, local operators, it's really a cooperative model, and local operators do have quite a bit of um, uh, power to change what's happening in their stores because really they're the, the owners and the operators. Um, other larger chains may not have the same kind of um, empowerment model for the local um, operators. So I think it, the answer, unfortunately, is that it depends. Um, starting a conversation, though, can never hurt. Okay, great. I, I would echo that. I would echo that, uh, the, uh, what Allison just said. 
Great. Thank you, Adam and Allison. Um, we do have a, another great question. How much have we researched results on the bottom line? How much of an increase in sales each improvement would result? Are you talking about like each individual change? We, we certainly don't have stuff that's, that, that's that granular. Uh, for well, let me, okay, let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, so for things like the, the scorecard or the uh, divided divided cards, we know that 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 will that will increase fruit and vegetable by you know 10, 15 percent. Okay, and that's so you know, the math and what the ROI is for that it depends a lot on buying patterns and a bunch of other things. So but we know that 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 is definitely a re revenue positive change. Uh, one because it costs no, essentially nothing to implement. And, and we know it increases the, the selection of fruits and vegetables. And there's a bunch of other work too that, that shows that every every dollar that's spent in the in the produce section leads to additional purchase around the store because what's in the produce section for most shoppers is not center of the plate. So you need additional things to, for preparation uh, and uh, you know to add, add on and spicing and things like that. So there's you know there can be a cascading effect. Um, uh, the way I can say categorically, that if you increase the number of things that people purchase in the produce section, it's a bigger basket that, that makes more money. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and the next question, were factors relevant to low-income stores evaluated in the store environment? These might include safety, appearance, cleanliness, pricing, variety of healthy foods, Stocking of foods needed for dietary guidelines for Americans and cultural groups. So uh, I would say the answer to some of those is yes. We don't do the scorecard is meant to evaluate the physical environment and is, is the environment organized in a way to promote the selection of the most helpful items available in the in the store. Now, obviously, if the store doesn't have uh, helpful items. Um, the scorecard doesn't directly, it's not designed directly to impact that. However, if you don't have four different kinds of, of uh, cut fruits, of, uh, you're not going to get those points, right? So it, it does have that thing. But the assessment of the product mix is not officially part of the scorecard because it's an environmental assessment tool. Okay, thank you, Adam. And our next question we received um, during Allison's presentation, and that is, can community members and youth conduct the surveys? How long did they take? And how are the data how are the data analyzed and then shared with the retailer in the community and the community? So um, this is probably a, a Answer best answer both by Adam and myself, but um, we did we did look at the questions. Many of them we could answer on our own, um, you know, sort of from a less informed perspective. No, not someone who, for example, is on the inner circle of a retailer to know really how things are working. That said, it is a little simpler, I think, to answer if you are the retailer. Um, the question about format and um, putting out there how well different stores do is something we had a lot of internal discussion about and I think um, is sort of embedded in the questions that we had, how does the retailer uh, feel motivated to use this or not motivated was sort of also implicit in that question. We talked about things like, um, you know, cool ideas for platforms that this could be presented on. The idea of, uh, you know, being able to rank or rate your store. Um, that said, you know, I think there's a lot of ideas that we came up with. I know there are for how we could do this in kind of cool ways, but um, we didn't really go forward with developing any of those platforms at this point. So it could be a, a point for future conversation. Um, but right now, there isn't really a platform where everybody could say, sort of report their stores' um, scores. Hey, thank you, Allison. And the next question was submitted um, during Adam's presentation. And you mentioned, Adam, the USDA Healthy School Challenge. And we just have a, um, a webinar attendee requesting if you could um, elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, on is the question like what is the healthy useful challenge? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Um, so it's something that the USDA sponsors, which involves a variety of dimensions around around the school, uh, from uh, working the cafeteria uh, and smarter lunchrooms is, is a criteria for um, uh, for you know, getting the different levels of healthy healthier U.S. school challenge. But it also uh, it has things like access to water, uh, physical activity, um, a couple of uh, other dimensions. So it's 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 just beyond just uh, part of the, the physical um, the, the physical environment that our scorecard is focused on, which because that's sort of the behavior piece. But essentially, it's a program that. Uh, USDA has put in place to encourage schools to make a number of changes around their buildings to encourage a healthy lifestyle in terms of activity and exercise and health, healthful eating. Uh, if, if you just go to the USDA website and Google uh, HUSCC or a Healthy U.S. School Challenge, you'll um, you'll get um, uh, you'll get a, a bunch of information about that. And schools get a variety of um, they, they can get a score, but they also can get actual money. Not a tremendous amount of money, but I think if you if you get a, a gold level, I think you might your school might get two thousand dollars, which is you know just use discretionary. But um, uh, principals would really like it because it's it's a, it's a really great bragging thing. Uh, so that's been one of the big big. It, that's been one of the big things that has, has helped schools that, uh, adopt the school score scorecard around because oftentimes smart lunchrooms is the easiest and quickest place for them to start attacking their healthy U.S. school challenge goals. Great. Thanks, Adam. That's really helpful. Another question for any one of the presenters. Did you provide any incentives to the store managers for participating in the study? Nope. Yeah, we didn't. Uh, we had offered a $25 gift card, but the retailers didn't want it. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, just looking through our other questions, make sure we get um, ones that have been um, repeated. Um, do you feel that when people hear organic, that they feel the same as when they hear a fancier brand name? Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. So organic is a, is a very interesting word in the food space. Uh, there's there's definitely a willingness to pay in you know, a lot of consumers for uh, for uh, for some of these label organic, but there's also a, a, a segment of the, the the retail shopping population who avoid it for that exact same reason because they think it's going to be more expensive. People also uh, make the assumption that organic food is is going to be uh, healthier, and I'm not talking about pesticides here. I'm talking about uh, higher nutrient content, um, but it also has a funny impact on people's uh, per, uh, perception of flavor. So if you label or, uh, yogurt organic, it tastes better. If you label label cookies organic, they taste worse. Um, <laughs> which is kind of kind of interesting. You know, so in other in other words, something that already has a, a health halo associated with it that helps by organic and if something that's indulgent is usually kind of uh, thought of as being uh, that it, it tends to diminish the, the thing. So uh, I don't know if that directly answers the question. I think specifically to how people respond to either a brand name or the tag organic is going to be highly dependent on the particular item, essentially, at the end, the end of the day. Uh, I think organic is probably less, and I'm, this is strictly a guess, but uh, organic is probably less effective on uh, a product like chocolate than a name like Giardelli. probably has more bump than, than organic, I'm guessing. Thanks so much, Adam. I think that's also, as far as labeling um, food items, I think that's also, also definitely rel uh, related to your study you, you mentioned about the wine and about perception of, of taste based on where, where the wine was from. Um, yep. And our next question, I'm interested in thoughts on how this tool might work differently in rural areas. And they're wondering about considerations that may need to be undertaken and adjustments that may need to be made. Would any oh, okay, of the... sorry. sorry, I thought it was I thought it was on mute there. Okay. okay. Uh, so <laughs> one of the one of the reasons that we had uh, the other reason that we we organized the scoring so that, uh, in the way that it's organized uh, to, so people can get to a baseline score relatively easily 
is that it allows the stores to mix and match. So I'm pretty confident, and we you know we did stay at test stores in, in some different environments. We didn't do as many you know truly rural, rural stores as you know, might be ideal. Uh, but the the goal was that, that any store should be able to mix and match from the different categories and uh, and should be able to achieve uh, the the diesel score. So we we tried to account for the difference in, in environment. I mean, it's a trade-off between making a specialized tool for a specific environment and making something that's comparable across different different areas. So we went with uh, having a single tool that would that would, would be malleable enough from a scoring point of view that could be used in a variety of environments. So nobody has to be great at, at the same things to both to get uh, to, to be equivalent from a promotion of health from an environmental and behavior point of view. That was that was our thinking with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that people will go. I'm sure there are there are stores that people will walk into and then say, "Well, this this tool isn't working as ideally uh, as uh, we would like." Um, but the overall goal was to make a tool that was as flexible as possible um, without uh, kind of gutting it and making it too too generic. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, our next question. What do we know about how some of these interventions sustain healthy shopping behaviors after the novelty of the change or new pattern implemented in the store wears off? So most people don't shop every day. So, so the novelty effect isn't necessarily as, as big as it would be in an environment where you're there all the time. But we know from work that we've done in homes that, like for example, one of our standard recommendations for folks who are say they're trying to lower their consumption of food in general is we say, okay, use smaller plates. There's no way that you don't know that you all of a sudden uh, don't have uh, the, the bigger plates. But what happens is you actually habituate to that, that routine and you end up, you know, you, you end up using, you end up serving yourself less, less food, even though you're aware of, of, of the intervention. So um, in, in, a, in a retail setting, yeah, some number of people are going to say, okay, well, all I have to do is turn left at this arrow, then I, don't, then I can avoid going into the, into the produce section. But some number of people will, will just, that, that's, that will be their, their habit. And they're not, you know, they, they're not, it's, the, the bigger thing is it's not the repeated environment every single day like you would see, you know, for, in a lot of environments. And we do see, we have some experience of this with, with, uh, with schools because you have kids, this is a problem I like to call the, the, the problem of the chronic repeat customer. Most businesses love to have repeat customers, but if you're in a corporate cafe or a school, you have the same people every day for you know, 10 months a year, 12 months a year. It, it, you, do, you can run into this issue of you know, kind of a customer boredom. But, but um, the right kind of uh, organizational things, people don't, they, they really don't work their way out of them. They just, you know, they, they, it actually helps them to build new habits. Uh, which is kind of really what the, the long-term goal of any of this stuff is. Um, if we were just relying on it being tricking them the, the first time they go in the shop, it wouldn't be that, that, that successful. The idea is bringing new sets of items into people's choice set on a regular basis so they can have a long-term behavior change. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, it looks like we'll have time maybe for one more question, and we've been seeing this a lot, um, and this, this might um, indicate a, a further discussion after, after the webinar today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to bring it up. Um, how can participants view a copy of the scorecard, scorecard, or is it available for public use or viewing? Um, so we will have the scorecard up on the Food and Brand Lab website, which we're actually in the process of kind of relaunching right now, uh, very soon. So within the next couple of weeks, we'll have a version up on, on our, our, our website so that they can check back there shortly. Um, hi, this is Julie, and I, and I would add to that, uh, it should be posted on the Healthy Food Access Portal shortly as well. Oh, great. Okay, great. Thank right now, it's in a very it's in a very utilitarian form, which uh, over time will will evolve into something that's uh, a little nicer to look at. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Adam, Julie, Amy, Allison, um, 
for speaking today. It looks like we're just at time. Um, and also thank you to all the participants in today's webinar. We hope you're able to take away a lot, excuse me, take away a lot from today. We encourage you to stay connected to the Healthy Food Access Portal via social media. Um, you can f go there for updates and announcements. And we also invite you to contact us using the email address here if you have any remaining questions that we weren't able to get to today. And finally, we ask that you complete the very brief survey on your screen as you exit the webinar. Your feedback is important to us, and we look forward to your ideas of future webinar topics and resources to share. And again, thank you, everyone, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.